All right, so this happened after we moved into our new place. Always be careful of the places you move into. It's one thing I learned after what happened to my family. We moved into this place, which was like a duplex. How it started was with my little one hearing growling in his room. He would come tell me. I found that strange and thought that maybe it was just his TV was left on. As time went by, I started to wake up with bruises and scratches. They would always be in threes. We would also sometimes see shadows. One morning, my husband saw someone go into the washroom. He thought it was one of our girls. So he waited at the kitchen table for them to come out. He heard water running for the longest time and no one came out. So he got up and no one was in the washroom, but the sink was running. Another thing we noticed was that all my children's behaviors slowly started to change. My older one started to become angry, and my second would stay in her room and became closed off. And my youngest would say that she saw a little boy playing in our living room. One night, when my husband was gone, I was in my room. All of a sudden, I heard banging in our kitchen, so I got up to look. All our drawers and cupboard doors were open, so naturally, I closed them and had this eerie feeling like someone was watching especially coming from the staircase coming up to our kitchen. It started off with things like that, and also banging on our door, which no one was ever there when we would look out the window to see who it might be. Things gradually got worse. One morning, my husband and I were getting ready. He was sitting at the edge of the bed when I looked. It was like he got pushed off the bed onto the floor. He looked like he was having some sort of seizure or something. I went to him. He looked at me. He said he felt like somebody had pushed him and that something had him and had a hard time fighting to let him go. The next morning we were getting ready again. He went to the washroom. I was in the room digging in the drawer. I saw someone standing at our bedroom door. I was looking up, about to say something because I thought it was my husband and no one was there. He was still in the washroom. I brushed it off and he came back. I closed the drawer, got up, went to the washroom, did my thing, and came back. My husband then tells me that after I left, the drawer opened after I shut it. I then told him I saw something standing at the bedroom door when he was in the washroom. After that, he would sometimes say that he was starting to feel like he was going to pass out. There were times when I had to hold him up. It was like the same thing was going to happen. Like when he got pushed off the bed in our room. Then one day, we were going up the stairs just getting home. He was behind me talking. And then he just got quiet. I didn't hear him talking behind me anymore. So I turned around. And he was hunched over by the window. Not moving. I walked back down the stairs, calling his name. But he wasn't moving at all. I held his face in my hands and looked at him, saying his name. Asking if he was okay. He opened his eyes. And they were all white. I just hugged him and said his name over and over. I kept asking if he was okay. Then he said. What happened? I told him. And he simply said. Let's go upstairs. We went to sit at the table and talked about what happened. He said he just remembered following me up the stairs talking. But that was it. I told him I didn't like what was happening especially to him and I wanted to get to the bottom of it so I did some phone calls and texting around I got a medicine person to come to our place the next day to bless our place and doctor my husband this is when it was confirmed we had something in our place and she said I left when she started praying and smudging after that our home felt better we also had the church come pray from room to room and as they were leaving our neighbors downstairs got them to pray for them in their place because apparently weird things were happening there as well. Things went okay for the next few days. We went about our business. We were coming home. We went upstairs. Then went out for fresh air. And as we were standing by the door talking, my husband said, All right, let's go upstairs. So we were going up again. And I didn't hear him coming behind me. I looked back, and he was standing by the door this time, with his head down, 
I then said, are you okay? He didn't answer me, so I kept asking him. Then, I was standing in front of him, talking to him and hugged him again, asking him, are you okay? Talk to me. That's when he looked up, and his eyes were all white again. Except this time, there was an evil smirk on his face. So I started yelling for my young adult son, who was upstairs. He wasn't answering or coming, but my youngest son heard me. I then told him to go get his big brother, so he then came, and I told him, go get my bundle, so he did. He came and ran it down to me. I pulled out my rattle, and I started shaking it on my husband's chest, telling the thing that was inside my husband to leave. That's when it started coming towards me closer. So I started walking up the stairs backwards, and I kept saying, get out of his body. Then, it laughed at me, and it was also saying something, but its voice was so low, I couldn't hear it, and thank God that I couldn't because I wouldn't want to know what it said. It grabbed my rattle, it tried breaking it. I was scared, but at the same time, I didn't want to show it. I could tell it got angry. It grabbed my rattle and started doing what I was doing, almost mocking me. So I put my face right in front of him, and I told him, This is my home, my house, and you are not welcome here, and I'm not scared of you. And I yelled for it to leave us alone. Then, that's when it turned around real fast and went running out of the house. I was so worried about my husband that I went running out trying to find him. But it was like he vanished. I then called a friend. I told her what happened and she came over right away. Then my husband called. He said he didn't know where he was at. And then he noticed he was on Silkirk Avenue and that he was throwing up like crazy. We went back and packed up our kids and some of our things. We left to stay in a hotel. The next day we got someone to come again to smudge and pray again. But this time, she said it was going to stay away for a while, but it was just going to come back again. Then she started asking if we found any sand or bells whenever we first moved in. My husband said that he had found a bell. She then told us someone who was there before us had used black magic and because of the things surrounding the place, it was just going to keep coming back. We were also told there were portals in my daughter's bedroom closet and in our closet and in the stairs where that thing kept jumping into my husband. So we packed up and left to stay in a hotel and started looking for a different place. But we had noticed my husband was starting to get sick again. And so we went to go see our pastor. Him and some of the elders performed a blessing, praying. Just as I pulled out my rattles, that's when he looked at me with the most evil eyes. The pastor then told me to move away from my husband. And as I did so, his eyes stayed on me, looking at me full of hate without taking its eyes off of me. We then all started to pray. Our pastor started to pray his way and my daughter and I with my rattles. As we started, my husband started getting sick, throwing up to the point that he fell over and started shaking like he was having a seizure again. Once we were done, he said he felt lighter and at peace. Later on, I also smudged him. I fanned him down and said a prayer. Never in a million years have I ever thought anything like this could happen to our family. And this stuff is real, not only just something that you see in the movie. I know I'm going to get a lot of pushback about native medicine working better than church medicine since they say that it doesn't heal true natives. However, I do want to say that both ways were done as I was raised the traditional way. There was no way of getting rid of whatever this thing was. As we were told by the medicine lady, witchcraft is white man medicine. This is why we chose to do both ways and it's healed my family just fine. We are native. Besides, she also said that we don't know where the evil originated from. So it was best to have both done just to make sure that everything went back to normal. There is a little more to our story and I'll save that for another time. I'm just happy my family is okay now and safe.
Back when I was young, I used to sleepwalk. My mom would tell me these stories about myself that I would have no memory about. She said it first started when I was around five or six years old. She had put me to bed one night. Then about an hour later, she heard a noise coming from down the hallway. She closed the book that she was reading and went to investigate. She told me that she found me sitting at the kitchen table, pretending to eat food. At first, she asked me what I was doing. And after not receiving a response, she got closer. She realized that I wasn't awake to respond. She stood there and she just watched me for some time as she hadn't actually seen a sleepwalker before. She said that I sat there acting as if I was eating. Then I would stop and turn the chair to my right. She said that to her, it appeared like I was having a conversation with someone, even though I wasn't saying any words, more like just slight whimpers and groans. I would then laugh quietly in my seat and then continue eating. After about 20 minutes of this, I got up from my chair, took a few steps and lay down on the floor. My mother then woke me up and told me that I needed to go back up to bed. Even though I don't remember this interaction, she told me I was incredibly confused as I thought I was in bed. She led me by the hand back to my bedroom and tucked me back in. A few months later, this happened again. My mother had gotten up in the middle of the night to get something to drink. As she walked into the kitchen, she nearly jumped out of her skin when she saw a silhouette of someone standing in front of the window. She switched on the kitchen light and saw that it was me standing in front of the glass. Motionless, she walked over to me asking what I was doing. Of course, when she got closer, she saw that my eyes were shut. Apparently, I stood at that window for nearly an hour before turning and walking back to my bedroom. My mom followed closely to make sure I went back to bed. And sure enough, I did. It was strange for me to hear about these things I was doing after I had fallen asleep. The concept that my body would move when I had no conscious control over it actually made me nervous. My mom found it somewhat amusing, but I didn't seem to think so. Over the following year, I only sleepwalked a few times. Most of them just ended up with me getting up from my bed and wandering into another room before falling asleep on the floor. My mother would find me the next morning and wake me up. After about a year had passed, my mother had gotten up one night and while she was passing by my room, she decided to peek in on me. When she opened the door, I was nowhere to be found. She wandered around the entire house but couldn't find me anywhere. Then, as she was walking through the living room, something out of the corner of her eye caught her attention. She saw the outline of someone standing outside underneath one of the street lamps. As she turned to get a better look, she realized it was me. She threw open the door and dashed outside. I was apparently standing in the center of the road, all by myself. Lucky for all of us, our street was on a dead end and didn't see too much traffic after 9 p.m. She called out my name as she ran towards me, but I didn't seem to react at all. As she got closer, she saw that I was moving my arms as if I was having a conversation with someone. She walked up to me and grabbed my wrist. When she did this, I apparently began to freak out, shouting and fighting against her, as if she were some sort of beast attempting to devour me. A minute or two later, I had woken up and snapped out of my frenzy. When I came to, I asked my mom what I was doing, and she explained that I had sleepwalked outside. I apologized to her, and she led me back inside. The months that follow, I would sleepwalk almost every other night. It got so bad that my mom took me to a few mental health professionals. Each of them told my mom that sleepwalking is quite common in children and that I should eventually grow out of it. They just gave her a list of things to be aware of if she finds me sleepwalking again, such as not waking me up in the middle of it. These explanations didn't really put my mother at ease. She wanted something a bit more concrete, so she kept searching until she came across the therapist who specialized in sleep disorders. 
It's such a bizarre part of my life that I barely remember it at all. The evidence I had that I used to sleepwalk all seemed to come from my mother telling me such. I apparently spoke with this doctor numerous times and I would visit him at least twice a week for three months straight. Then one day, my mother stopped taking me to see him and according to her, I hadn't had a sleepwalking episode since then. Nearly 15 years have passed since then and it all just seemed more like a dream than a memory as if it happened to somebody else and I just heard about it. Of course, I believe my mom. I doubt she would make up something like that. It just never really clicked that I had this problem when I was younger. That was until I was helping my mom clean out some of her things out of her basement. She was going through all of her storage and was getting rid of a bunch of things. As I was pulling out boxes, something clattered to the floor. It was a very thick manila file folder that hit the ground. Hoping that I didn't break anything important, I stopped what I was doing. After glancing at it, I noticed on the front that it had my name on it with some dates. I looked around to make sure my mom wasn't nearby, and I tucked the folder into the back of my pants. After finishing everything up, I told her I would talk to her later, and I headed back home to my house. When I got inside, I tossed my jacket on the couch and pulled out the folder. As I peeled open one end and slid the large file out, my eyes darted across the front of it. It was records of my time with the therapist. I guess he must have given my mother a copy of all this to keep. All the entries inside were each of the days I had gone to visit him. Most of them were just logs of the sessions, as well as a few notes he had taken throughout. One of the last entries drew my attention. It said that the therapist was going to conduct some type of hypnosis on me. Apparently it was some sort of therapy. He had me lay down on a chair and began telling me to relax while asking me questions. He asked me what I dreamed about. I told him that I dreamed of my friend. Reading this, I had no idea who I was talking about. The therapist then asked me to describe this friend of mine. I told him that he was much taller than me, but for a child, that was insane too much. His body always seemed to be hunched over. He had long black hair that fell down to his shoulders. His arms were extremely long, like two snakes attached to the shoulders. Each of his fingers came to a point like sharpened knives. The therapist then asked me to tell him what his face looked like, and apparently, I struggled to describe it. I told him that his face was blurry, like it was covering TV static. When the therapist continued asking me questions about my friend, apparently, I sat up in the chair, still asleep and told the therapist to look at him for himself. I then pointed to behind the therapist, and when he turned, he saw nobody. He jotted down some notes and then asked me what my friend wanted. I told him that he wants to take me somewhere far away so that we can both play together. He then made another note, then through a series of careful statements, he rid my mind of negative dreams. Well, that's what he wrote down anyway. Since that day, I have slept peacefully without any more sleepwalking incidents. All those memories I had from the early years of my life actually seemed blurry and I had nearly forgotten about them all. Despite not knowing anything about those statements I made, I couldn't help but feel a little bit familiar with the description of this friend of mine. As I closed the file, I sighed. Thinking about all the things I had said in those notes, I looked at the clock which read 10.23 p.m. As I stood up from my chair, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. For the briefest of seconds, I thought I had saw someone standing outside. Someone tall, with long arms, with long black hair, someone with a blurry face. I blinked my eyes, and when I opened them again, it was gone. I wanted to rationalize what I had just seen as a result of reading those files that my tired mind had simply made me see this. But for some reason, I can't seem to shake this feeling that those weren't simply dreams. The dreams that I had been experiencing when I was a kid. I'm starting to think that there were something much more than dreams. Something much more 
sinister. I can feel my eyelids starting to become heavier by the minute. And for the first time in my life, I'm scared about what's going to happen if I fall asleep again. It's been a long time. My aunt told me the story. We're actually related by marriage. So she has a whole new set of skinwalker stories that I would like to share with you. This story took place when she was a child. My aunt's family lived in a community about 20 miles south of Gallup, New Mexico. The area is far different from where I live. My house is surrounded by desert and you don't really see trees until you move into the canyon. Bread Springs is a forested area and it's where our story takes place. Like many people on the res, my aunt's family didn't have running water or electricity. In order to get some, they would have to drive into town and pull water back in large containers. The containers are huge and easily fit in the bed of a truck. Her family would place two containers on a long flatbed trailer to make the best of each trip. So her family went into Gallup, filled up the containers, and went around town doing other types of business. Back then, seatbelt laws weren't so strict, and so my aunt and her siblings sat in the bed of the truck as they went around town. It began to get dark and so the family started going back home. Most roads weren't paved and so they had to drive very carefully because of the trailer as well. The lights of town faded away in the distance and soon the vehicle was surrounded by darkness. They drove and the kids sat in the back and talked among themselves. However, that was until my aunt noticed something. There was a figure crouched by the furthest water container on the flatbed. The truck wasn't barreling down the road but it was going at a speed that would be impossible for anyone to run and jump on. My aunt nudged her siblings and they all paused to look at the dark figure. They all got silent and squinted their eyes to look. It was too dark to really make anything out, so they ignored her and continued to talk. My aunt kept her eye on the figure and pulled hard on the sleeve of her brother when the sting began to crawl over one of the water containers. The kids all stopped and watched in fear as the figure began to move carefully over the second container. My aunt said that the figure looked like a person. However, its limbs were abnormally long. With these long limbs, it was pulling its body closer to the kids. At this point, they began to scream and cry. They banged on the window of the truck. At this time, the creature was reaching for the tailgate of the truck. Due to the huge commotion that was now going on in the bed of the truck, the driver slammed on the brakes. The creature hit the tailgate and fell down in between the truck and the trailer. The driver rolled down the window and asked what was going on. The kids screamed at the driver to go. They weren't sure they were safe until they saw that the trailer moved up and down as if it ran over something large. When my aunt told me the story, I sat in disbelief. She told me she was uncomfortable when it was crawling on the trailer, but true fear rang through her body when she saw its eyes. I asked her what she meant. She said that they were like teddy bear eyes. I didn't quite understand what that meant until I pressed further. She said that its eyes were shiny. When you shine the light in the eyes of an animal, they reflect back. The brake lights were shining and whatever they saw that night, had eyes that were glowing back. My grandfather told me a story once as we sat around a campfire in his backyard in the cool night of the Arizona desert. The horizon was clear and each star twinkled in a purple sky with a full fat moon hanging low over the mountains. His voice was raspy, the result of a lifetime of smoking cigars and drinking whiskey. The fire danced and shined across his wide dark eyes as he settled into his seat. 
ready to tell his story. Way back when I was a boy, about your age, I lived outside a reservation with your great grandfather. He had returned from the war and set about raising horses and cattle on a 100 acre ranch settled between a brambly mountainside with good dirt for growing thorn brush and not much else. One night, my mother was sick and Pa and I took a trip into town about 50 miles away, straight through a dry desert over a washed out creek and some old abandoned farmsteads. Pa and I were driving in an old Ford pickup truck. I remember it was dark out, inky and thick, with only the lights of our old truck lighting up the road. I remember it so much. The engine began to sputter and the truck slowed to a jerky stop. Damn it, Pa said, guiding the Ford to the side of the road. As it coasted to a stop, my Pa said, stay here, son and he stepped out into the darkness, shutting the door with a heavy thud. My window was down, and the cool desert air was breezy, and felt good on my hot face and neck. Paul was getting water from the back to cool down the engine, and that's when I smelled it. Rotten eggs. Strange, I thought, to smell sulfur in the desert. My nose also picked up the smell of one of those dead bloated cattle that would drop from the heat and lay there until the crows pecked enough holes in their hide to cause the whole thing to explode. It stunk and I gagged. My skin started to tingle too. The back of my neck felt itchy and my face started to get very hot. The wind stopped blowing with the stink filling the cab. Pa, I called out, no answer. My heart started beating and I felt such a fear in me, in my bones, in my chest. I tell you, I never felt fear like this. Not until Vietnam. Not until I saw men dying around me. I locked the door and reached over for my paused door and saw a shadow bound across the road through both dim beams of light across the partly open hood. Grandfather paused telling the story. He spit a fat piece of tobacco to his side, and he looked very pensive into the darkness. I realized I was holding my breath and gasped for air. The night was breezy, but I was sweating and clammy. What about your father? What did you see? My grandfather, continuing the story, sighed. A creature. He shook his head. You have to understand, there were legends, old legends, much older than what's out there in the valley, older still than Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull, than the old chiefs and their shamans, the Apache and Hopi and Cherokee and all them old tribes and first peoples. They told tales. They told stories about dark magic. Something about a deal made with the old spirits of blood sacrifice to gain power, old power, enough to fight each other and the Spaniards, and later the white man that came for their land and women, they called them. He paused. Grandfather took a deep breath and looked towards the fire, to the sky, the desert, the creek, the moon, the sun and then leaned a little bit and said they would call them skinwalkers, old warriors resurrected as skinless men, walking on deer legs with the torso of a man and the head of a coyote, but they were messed up, long and disfigured, teeth like a bowie knife, long arms and standing seven feet tall even hunched over. They would gut the old cowboys and white riders. They'll run through the bullets, part the Spanish armor like it was a potato sack. And boy, could they change their voice to match a person you knew or might know. And that's what I saw. 
big and fast. Only for a second, it ran across the road, gray and molted, muscle flexing under its legs, clumping on the road, stringy muscle hunched shoulders, and it turned, looked right into the cab, and looked at me, right into my eyes. And I swear, I swear, it grinned at me. I sank into my seat. In fear, shaking, I knew my death was coming. I smelled ozone and brimstone. The air felt like right before the lightning comes and blows a tree to smithereens, charged them full with power. I yelled for Pa, but no words came out, just a dry squeak. I started to shake as my grandfather told his story. He was still here, so I knew he lived. But the supernatural always fascinated me, and even now, I felt the force of his words. The real power of skinwalkers was trickery. Sure, they could change their voices, but also their skin. That's why the gods took their hide, so they could take others. Not for long, the legend says, maybe an hour, before the soul of the skin that they were wearing would come looking for their mortal shell before going to whatever hell awaited them. Even though I think that getting skinned alive was hell enough. A minute passed in what felt like a lifetime, one second in 1,000 years. My father's door opened and I jerked my head to the left, putting up my hands to fend off an attack. Son, it's me, my father said. Before climbing into the cab, he got the steering wheel and pulled himself in an awkward way, jerking himself into the seat. I cringed into the corner. I looked at him. I looked hard. Your great-grandfather was a good man. Treated me and my mom right. He fought the Nazis and saw the worst of man in Poland when he freed all those camps. And now, I was taking his measure. Is this my father? Do I make a run? Or do I die? Is it him or not? Let's go get that medicine for your mom. As he pulled the truck into gear and pulled it out into the road. And our trip resumed. I guess it was him after all. But how did you know? Was it because he said something about your mom? I knew, because out the window, out the corner of my eye, I saw that same beast running 50 miles an hour right next to our car, looking at me with those yellow eyes and grinning mouth. I looked and saw it, hunched and angry, running next to us. My pa kept his eyes on the road, looking straight ahead. Son, he said. Don't look at it. That's how I knew it was my dad. He knew what to do. And he kept telling me to just keep looking straight ahead and to not look at whatever was around us running. He then told me that by acknowledging its presence, you give it power. That's where my grandfather finished the story. I kept staring at him, but by this time, he was just looking straight ahead, looking around me, and said we should go inside. As we went inside the house, he then told me to not ever mention skinwalkers. He also said that speaking their name out loud or mentioning them at all, even in text, even in stories, even if someone else is telling you a story, is supposed to make them aware of your existence. I want to remain anonymous due to the nature of the story. See, I was in the Marines. I wasn't in any special forces or anything unique per se. I was just a regular rank and file Marine. I was stationed at the 29 Palms Marine Corps Air Ground Combat Training Center 
I wasn't the only one who had seen or experienced things in the training grounds and surrounding areas. I was told to keep my mouth shut, but I'm gonna die soon anyways, so even if they do come for me, it's not gonna make a difference. It was early April, so the weather wasn't too bad. It wasn't hot during the day, and it wasn't cold at night. I always enjoyed doing field ops during that time of the year. I got away from all the dumb shit that we had to do day in and day out back on the main side, and I was always left to my own when I was out in the field. So late one night, me and a buddy of mine are doing fire watch for our section of the rest area. We had our rifles, helmets with our night vision goggles mounted on the front, and rifles with us. We also had four mags and live ammo. That night, an artillery group was doing night practice, so you'll hear the echo of the guns followed by the sound of the shells hitting the ground and exploding. Me and my friend were talking about just random crap when I flipped down my night vision goggles and saw movement out in the distance. At first, I thought it was just the green tint of the goggles fucking with my head, but then I saw it again. I tapped my buddy and asked if he was seeing this. He flipped down his night vision goggles too, and he nodded. Yeah, but what is it? A coyote? He asked. No man, it's too big to be a coyote. Besides, it looks like it's running around on two legs. I said back to him. That's when he tapped me and pointed out into the dark. Hey, there's more than one bro, he said. I looked to where he was pointing, and that's when I saw four, or five, other figures moving around in the dark. These things weren't that big. I would say maybe about 5'5", five five, give or take. They also appeared to be very strong and built with massive arms and leg muscles. They were dark. They had big dark eyes and no nose to speak of. Their mouth was wide and filled with razor sharp teeth. They walked around hunched over with their arms dangling by their sides. Their arms themselves were massive. They were running at crazy speeds, occasionally running on all fours. They had four fingers on each hand, and the claws were long and sharp. It was like they had daggers for their nails. Dude, I think they're getting closer. I nodded. Yeah, I'm gonna go get the corporal up. He nodded, and I raced over to where our corporal was sleeping at and shook him away. There's something out there. You need to come take a look. He cursed under his breath and sat up. This better be good, he said as he sat up. And then, that's when we heard gunfire. I raced back to my buddy who was shooting in the dark. I looked and I saw these creatures out in the dark, maybe four to three hundred yards away. As other marines had woken up to the sound of my buddy shooting, the officer in charge came running up asking what the fuck was going on. When we pointed to the creatures, he froze in place. About this time we heard tons of gunfire suddenly erupt from another unit who was conducting training as well. When I looked back at where these things were, they were no longer there. Instead, they were running on all fours, directly at us. I raised my rifle and began to fire at them as those with guns and ammo joined in and the others who didn't ran back to get theirs. I lined up my sights with the closest one and began to fire into it. I saw chunks of its flesh get ripped off when I hit it and it tumbled down. But without missing a beat, it regained its balance and kept running at us. At this point, I knew our rifles were useless, but I wasn't going to leave my buddy. That's when I heard the officer in charge yelling for us to get back in the trucks and get the fuck out of there and get back to mainside. Me and my friends turned and booked it for our 7 ton. I flipped on the battery switch and my buddy cranked the truck on. As we began to start moving, I looked out the window in time to see these things reach the camp. A marine who hadn't realized what was going on until it was too late was impaled by one of the creature's claws and fell to the ground. I watched as he tried to crawl away, but this thing leaned over a bit on his upper torso and completely bit off his head with a single bite. As we began to get out of there, I saw a Humvee that had three of these things on racing towards it. The guy in the turret tried to flip the 50 cal around to unload into the creatures, but he wasn't fast enough. 
and one of these creatures ripped him out of where he was at and threw him to one of the others. He didn't have time to move before the thing sank its claws into his chest and began to devour him. I watched as the thing on top of the Humvee then jumped down into the hood and shattered the bullet resistant front glass and pulled out the mangled corpse of the driver and ran off into the desert with him. The remaining three marines got out and made a run for our truck. I tapped my buddy to let them get on. However, they never made it. One by one the things picked them all off and ran off with them, their screens fading into the desert. By the time we got back into the main road back to the main side and caught up with the rest of our unit, we noticed how active the night sky had become. There were helicopters everywhere with searchlights. We figured someone had called it and they were trying to find the creatures or the missing marines. Well, what was left of them anyways. When we were next up at the checkpoint, I noticed something off about the guys manning it. They were wearing all black and each one of them had a black ski mask over their face and their night vision goggles down. They didn't have any patches, name tapes, or IDs with them. They were armed to the teeth though. One of their vehicles had a mini gun mounted on it. They all carry high power rifles with high tech sights, laser sights, and other attachments on their rifles. When it was our turn they had us step out of the truck and tell them what we saw. After we explained everything, the guy in charge looked at my friend and listed off his full name, date of birth, social security, where his mom and dad were, the name of his dog that he had when he was in middle school. He then looked at me and did the same thing. Once he was done, he looked at both of us. If you ever say a word of what actually happened here tonight, you and your families will disappear for good. Do you understand? We both nodded with our jaws on the floor. The guy had mentioned things that I had never told anyone about. They sent us on back to the main side of the base. I got out about a year after that, but I never went on another field op again. To this day, I still remember that night. When I go to bed each night, I just hope that whoever they were, they kill those things so no more marines have to go out like that. In short, if you're ever stationed in 29 Palms Cali and you go on a field op, keep an eye out in the dark and be sure you aren't too far away from a vehicle and also pray that those things don't decide to turn you into a meal. I had been a hunter for most of my life. Leading up to this incident, the smell of the warm air and the beauty of nature always had me at ease. I never felt scared alone at night because I have seen everything there is to be scared of. I have seen bears the size of a small car and animals so vicious they would kill anything that moved. The one thing I was never scared of was deer. I heard the tales of the skinwalker, the wendigo, and pretty much anything in between. My uncle was an expert in tracking and hunting. We always went on trips together and would always come back with a fresh kill. He had something about him. It was a rule. I remember it because it was weird. He never wanted to go hunting in winter. I never asked why. I'm not sure but something about it always had me on edge. One day, it was winter and I was about to go deer hunting when my uncle stopped at my front door. When he came in, he saw my pack supplies and my rifle and knew I was about to go hunting. He immediately burst into a raft of anger as he dragged me to a wall and got into my face. What the fuck do you think you're doing? His spit went all over my face as he looked at me crazy. He looked primal as if he was fearful of something that he did not want to share. It was the same face you would expect a child to make if they were dumped in the middle of nowhere. The same face of fear that you see in people who have PTSD. I calmly brushed them off and got to the door saying I was going to go hunting. 
I was not about to fight with my uncle and ruin this trip as I hadn't gone hunting for close to a month. When you start hunting, you get adjusted to it. And then when you go on breaks, you actually miss it. As I got into my truck, my uncle peered at me out the window. He was there to take care of my house, but before I reversed, he left with the door open. My uncle is prone to outburst, as I should mention. He's only ever done it a few times, and it's always in a situation where the reaction suits it. Not this one, however. What was so bad about hunting in the winter? The spot I had planned was an isolated one. It was a huge forest area, which I had not been to before. I obviously had mapped the area out and brought essential survival tools in case the worst came, but I never thought I would have to use it after all those years out in the forest. When I arrived, the crisp, cold air immediately saturated me in discomfort. I quickly got another layer of clothes on before I started to walk to where I would set up camp for the night. The clearing I had chosen was a pretty tight one. There was a big tree in the center that stood above the rest. It was called the Forest Star, which suited it. Around the clearing, the forest was extremely dense. Almost no sun shone through the top. There was a small hunting tower north of the entrance of the clearing, so it was a direct walk from camp. As I walked ahead, I noticed something. There were small droplets of blood littering the ground. My first thought was that it must have been an injured animal or something like that. But the droplets were small and almost even. I shook the thought out of my head and made it to my setup and I started to pin my tent. When I was done, I checked my watch. It was around 5.30 p.m. I had around two hours for hunting before it was pitch black and so I made it to the tower. When I undid my rifle from its case, I heard scampering. Shaking it off, I took my spot and waited. As I stood there, time almost slowed down. I was in a precise focus and was ready for anything. I wasn't ready for what I saw though. Out came two small bucks that seemed injured. There were small droplets of blood coming from their eyes. As I focused in, I saw that it wasn't dry blood. It was fresh and it was oozing from their eyes. I was shocked. I had never seen anything like it. Many different scenarios ran through my head. I was thinking, had a hunter shot both of them in the eyes and managed to not kill them? But the scenarios I was coming up with seemed more unlikely than the last. I took aim at the closest one and shot it. It stood there for a second just not moving. Then they trotted off as if nothing happened. Blood was running from the wound, so I know I had obviously hit it. But it didn't seem scared nor phased. I decided that was enough and sort of jogged to my sight. I was freaked out and decided that I would cook dinner and go to bed early. When I scampered around my pack, I pulled out a can of beans. I grabbed the pot and started a fire and began cooking them. As I cracked open a beer, the familiar sound of a branch snapping sounded off next to me. I thought it was maybe a small deer and I brushed it off as I sat and relaxed. I was thinking about the deer and I started to chalk it up to the fact I must have not hit it deep enough and the deer must have been in shock. When I finished eating, I went to bed. I was shivering in the night cold and I could feel my body shaking uncontrollably. As I dozed off after a brutal two hours of cold, I heard another snap. This time, however, it was more loud, like a bear. I immediately grabbed my rifle and went out of my tent. My fire burned low and in the distance I saw two red lights. I walked towards it when my mind started to race. Something felt wrong. As I closed the distance, my gut was literally twisted. My mind was anxious and I felt like I was about to break down. 
Then I realized what was wrong. Those weren't lights. They were two big solid red eyes. There were just orbs hovering. When I realized I stood frozen, I thought it was a big cat. But what emerged was so much worse. Its fur was black, darker than the night around us. Its antlers were twisted and uneven. But the worst part, it was crying, blood. Deep red droplets were pelting down in its unnatural eyes. I couldn't make a sound. I was frozen in fear. Then, it started to make sounds. The sounds of a baby crying. It was horrible. The sounds of unnatural cries filled the cold air making it worse. My body felt crumpled and so I finally broke out into a sprint. When I looked back it stood there. It wasn't even breathing. But the sounds of that baby crying weren't fading. It was like a speaker was attached to my ear. When I made it back to camp I rushed to pack my stuff. In a hurry I ran leaving the tent behind and I rushed to my truck. As I fumbled with the keys, I saw that something was walking slowly towards me. That's when the whispering started. Terrible, faint voices echoed throughout the forest as my mind started to close. I felt my cerebral melting as anything I tried to do would not happen. It was like sleep paralysis. As I stood there, I found the strength to finally open the door and get in my car. I slammed the door shut and that thing was right at the window. I started to sob as I jammed the keys in the ignition. My mind felt fried as I swerved out of there. I didn't care if I hit anything. I just wanted to be away from that thing. And then, before I could back out, it stood up on its legs and it repeated a voice I recognized. You, you do not escape the... The forest are mine. It was my grandpa's voice. He died when I was six. And I never knew any of the details. The thing then made a terrible shrieking noise. That hurt my entire body. As it did so. I heard scampering as more of those things came out. They had blood running from their eyes as well. The baby cry started again. And that's when I finally drove out of that fucking place. When I raced home, I barged into the door. My shoulder ached, but I didn't care. I shoved my door and locked it and ran into my kitchen. That's when I saw my uncle sitting at the table, enjoying a small glass of scotch. So, you saw what I saw, didn't you, Anthony? I couldn't form a single word. I was so shocked. My uncle came up to me and said, What you saw out there is my rule that I abide by. There are things in those forests in winter that are so horrible that even the most seasoned can't handle it. I saw it when I was a boy and since then I will never go hunting during winter. I finally muster a sentence What was it? He took a small sip before sitting me down. You saw something called Herberac. It's an old, ancient being that dwells in the forest during these winters. Hunters who see it never are the same again, but some never even come home. I was lucky. My uncle sort of sniffled as he told me about his encounter with Herberac when I was 23. My father and I went out into the woods on a very cold winter to hunt. Our family was struggling so we didn't have much food. When we were hunting, my father called out to me, but before I could even get to him, I heard him yelled out before he fell silent. I never saw him again, but what stood there was worse than the loss of my own. A deer, 
with red eyes, black fur, and twisted antlers stood there. Blood was running from its eyes. Then it started to cry like a baby. My uncle stopped and had to take a second before continuing. I comforted him as I was teary-eyed. It ran after me, Anthony, on two legs. It was like a human, and I rushed to get away from it. He rolled up his sleeve to reveal a terrible red scar that ran across the entire underside of his arm. It was trying to feast on me. It knew I feared it, but eventually I managed to lose it. He finally finished his scotch before continuing. I was stuck in the forest for three days, fighting to survive. I heard its cries and whispers all around. As I tried to make it out, I finally arrived at a road and was taken in by the police. No trace was found of my father except for one thing. They found blood at the scene and tested it. It belonged to my father. What was strange about it, it was mixed with his tears. Then my uncle finally stood up. Fear it, for it now knows who you are. Those were his last words. He left my house and the police found him wrapped up in a noose two days later. It broke me. My hunting buddy and best friend was gone. There was one detail about his suicide that was never resolved. He had droplets of blood coming from his eyes. The coroner's inspection said it was an aneurysm, but I'm not sure that is the truth. I'm 50 years old now, and I haven't been hunting in two decades. I can't even go into the forest anymore. I'm thinking about going back and seeing what Herberak is. Maybe I can kill him. So beware of Herberak, for he lurks in the forest, out in the cold. I love camping, but after my most recent trip, I don't think it will ever be the same. I set up my tent on nice, flat ground and collected some wood for a fire. The night came with all its nightly sounds, and I relaxed at the owls and chirping crickets. Even better was the fact that no one else was around. Hell, it was subtle. I almost missed it. The voice came from deep within the woods, and for a moment, I didn't believe what I was hearing. It sounded almost like a female, but strange enough, I just couldn't tell. Please help. It continued. I shined my flashlight between the bushes and walked around. To be completely honest, even as a grown man, I was paralyzed with fear. So, I did the responsible thing and called the local police. That's when things went from being odd to very, very weird. The police actually told me to ignore it. I explained to them that someone could be injured and maybe needed medical attention, but they assured me otherwise. When I kept pushing and asked why, they told me, Sir, if you ever hear that voice again, ignore it, do not respond, and do not approach. Well, I did hear it, again, but I didn't ignore it. It was almost midnight when I heard the voice a second time. I awoke to someone whispering, no. and it sounded like she was just outside my tent. I went outside to check and no one was there. But the voice continued from a distance. Help, please. Again, I grabbed my flashlight and looked around the area I was camping. I was too afraid to follow the voice into the woods. 
especially since the authorities themselves avoided it. But I struggle morally, trying to decide whether I should go and help this person or listen to the police who were concerned for my safety. But then I heard another different voice. This other voice, which also seemed to be coming from the woods, was an octave lower. Unlike the first one, which cried for help, this one was loud and demanding. Quiet, the other voice demanded. No one's going to help you. Once I heard that, I was pretty sure someone was in trouble, so I called the police again. When I informed them about a second voice coming from the woods, they seemed even more concerned. They told me that I should pack up my things and leave the campsite immediately. They said that hearing the second, more manly voice meant that it was getting desperate. They also said that the two voices were coming from the same person. That part was bizarre and confused me, to say the least. It was at this point I dismissed the police in that area as crazy, but not before telling them off. I got angry. I told them that if they didn't get down here to come and check it out, then I would do it myself. I said that a woman could be in serious trouble and that it was their job to help her, but they still refused to come. All they kept repeating to me over the phone was, do not enter the woods, sir. They actually seemed more afraid than I was. Once I hung up the phone, I heard the voices again. A gentle, please, somebody help me. And then, a growling. Quiet. No one's coming. It was a little past midnight at that point. I couldn't live with myself knowing that I had the chance to save someone's life, but instead became a coward. So I grabbed some things and ventured into the woods. When I entered the woods, the voices ceased. Just like that, no cries, no whispers, and no commands. Even the owls and crickets went away. Nothing but dancing leaves and creaking tree branches. I stopped walking and looked around, a full 360 degrees. Hello? Anyone here? I called out. Nothing. I'm here to help, I continued. Where are you? Are you okay? Still, nothing. I thought of calling the police again, then chuckled to myself. I found it strange, but somewhat comforting that I didn't find anyone out there. Regardless, I was still creeped out. So I packed my things and finally left the campsite. I didn't know why the police, of all people, were so afraid. Worst case, someone was in actual danger, and we all failed them. To be honest though, when I heard the voice the very first time, I did think it was a joke. When I heard it the second time, along with that other voice, I became a bit more concerned. And same with the third time I heard it in the woods. However, when I heard it again, for the fourth time, a week after, I left the campsite, coming from inside my own house, I became very, very concerned. I was the first to notice an extra person had joined our group. I counted six of us sitting around the campfire, but I knew we had left home with five. The sixth person had joined us somewhere along the way, but where and when exactly, I could not be sure. All the glowing faces looked familiar, like I had known them all for a lifetime. That was why it took so long to find a man out of place. I had to go through the faces one by one. I went through my history with them, recounting how I met them, how I knew them. I fit each one into my memories like puzzle pieces. 
first, it was Mark. He was sitting next to Sarah, talking with her as always. I met Mark and Sarah six years ago in the 10th grade. Mark and I played wide receiver together on the school football team. Sarah was a cheerleader, and Mark always had a thing for her. The three of us started hanging out after games, Mark flirting nonstop, and Sarah always hilariously rebuking him after a while. Then, there was Ben. We had been best friends since the first grade. Ever since we bumped heads playing tag during recess, he had his arm around his longtime girlfriend, Justine. She started at our school when she moved from Chicago in the seventh grade. Ben sat next to her in class, and soon she became a part of our group at that time. She was quiet and shy when she first arrived, but once we got to know her, she opened up. She was one of the coolest and nicest people you could ever get to meet. She had also become close with Sarah in the past few years. And then, there was the sixth face. The piece that did not fit. I stared at him, and his name escaped me. That is, if I ever had it in my memory banks in the first place. He looked familiar, but I could not place him in my memories. But why, if I recognized him? Why could I not remember his name? Why did he sit among us, acting as if he belonged here? He stared at Mark and Sarah as they chatted. He started laughing when they would laugh, smile when they smile. I couldn't figure it out. The question burned in my head. How had he, a stranger, joined our little group without any of us noticing something amiss? Hey, Porter. Ben pulled me from my thoughts. Your head up in the clouds or something? I was just telling Justine about our fifth grade teacher. What was his name again? Mr. Smith, I said. Oh yeah, Mr. Smith. I was telling Justine how you could rile that guy up like nobody else could. Remember that one time you gave your homework printed in yellow ink? Ben and Justine laughed. Yeah, I remember. I said. I can still see the steam coming out of his ears. They laughed again, and I semi joined in. When I glanced the strange man's way, he was watching us, grinning, just watching, part of the reason he had flown under the radar. I was struck with the sense that he was studying us. My skin started to crawl. Ben drained his beer and threw the empty can in the cooler. Well, I gotta take a leak, he said and walked into the woods, swallow up by the darkness. You really know how to push people's buttons when you want to, huh? Justine said. I shrugged. I was having trouble focusing on the conversation. The weight of the situation, the reality of it, was starting to hit me. A strange man had attached himself to our group unnoticed. And who the fuck knew what his motivations were? Questions raced through my mind. None I could answer. How had no one else noticed yet? Why had it taken me so long to notice? Was I going insane? Am I forgetting things and forgot this one friend of ours? The strange man then stood with jerkiness. I gotta take a leak, he said. It was the first time I heard him speak. He spoke in a strange way. It sounded as if he had to force the words from his throat. He walked with an awkward gait, and like Ben, disappeared behind the dark veil of the trees. No one else flinched. Justine kept talking. I always loved the long relationship you and Ben have. It was so hard moving cities and leaving all my old friends behind. I mean... I can't complain too much. I wouldn't have met Ben and all you guys otherwise. Justine, don't you see what's going on here? Huh? You're telling me you haven't noticed? Notice what, Porter? What are you talking about? Who was that guy? I gestured to the vacated spot the strange man left behind. Oh, him? He's, um, what's his name? She trailed off. She frowned into the fire. 
I could see her mind taking over and her eyes twinkle with concern. I knew I wasn't going crazy. I don't know, she said. Who is it? That's what I'm trying to figure out. We stared at each other. Maybe Justine was cut off. An ear-piercing screech came from the woods. It sounded like a shrill, injured cat, a large cat. The sound split in the air and cut our conversations short. A blanket of silence fell over the four of us. Only the crackling campfire persisted. The woods were still and quiet. The fuck was that? Mark broke the silence. I don't know, Sarah said. I have never quite heard an animal like that before. Sounded like some fucked up mountain lion, Justine said. Have you ever heard anything like that before? I shook my head. My fingers tingle with adrenaline. Ben was still in the woods, and the strange man was out there with them. Dread filled my gut. There's no mountain lions out here, Mark said. Most likely an elk. They can make some creepy sounds. Sarah agreed. Justine bit her lip and scanned the woods. It's okay. I think Mark's right, I said to her. But I wasn't sure I believed it. Mark and Sarah had started up their conversation again when the strange man came out of the woods. They paid him no mind. I was hoping something would have triggered in them by now, but they were oblivious. The strange man took a beer from the cooler. He fumbled with it, struggling with the tab. It was as if he had never opened the can before. When he finally got it open, he sat beer in hand and continued to watch Mark and Sarah a thin smile on his face he never did take a sip I watched them from across the campfire his head wavering behind the heat I touched on what made me uneasy about this strange man aside from the fact that he had managed to infiltrate our group without any of us noticing for a long time he moved with jerkiness and awkwardness, like a newborn animal. Nothing he did was well practiced. It made everything he did look like an act, an imitation. I didn't make the connection at the time, but I should have seen this man was not quite human. But at the moment, I wasn't sure what to think. I guess I just thought he was a freak. I considered calling him out then and there I wanted to ask him just what the fuck he was doing but I will admit I was a little scared I had visions of this guy being some horrific serial killer and I didn't know how dangerous he was or if he was armed I didn't want to push him into doing something drastic that got all of us killed as time went by without any sign of Ben I became convinced the strange man had done something to him. I watched him plan and marking his next target. Anger sprouted from my fear and I started to see red. I needed to stop him. We used an axe to chop firewood for our campfire and it was leaning against my seat. This man was dangerous. I was sure of it. I convinced myself I needed to do something before another one of us was next. I clutched at the axe's handle. Justine touched my arm. Porter, where's Ben? I'm getting nervous. It's okay. I lied, patting her hand. I'm sure everything is okay. I stood with the axe in hand. I'm gonna go get some more firewood, I announced. More awkward than I hoped. Uh, okay, dude, Mark said. Porter? Justine's voice. Speaking up was a mistake. I had drawn the attention of the strange man. I walked past him, trying to act as nonchalant as possible. But I was never a good actor. He watched me the whole way. He kept his glare on me as I reached the area of the woods. And as he looked back, his head rotated around an unnatural distance. 
that was enough to chill my spine. I was hoping he would turn around to look away and give me an opening, but he never did. I'm not exactly sure what happened next. I never saw him stand up and walk over to me. I never even saw him move a single muscle. But just like that, in an instant, he was standing in front of me, inches away from my face. It was as if he had teleported. A metallic smell stung my nose. The strange man stunk of blood and copper. The axe trembled in my hand. Any thought of actually using it fled my mind. I locked into place, my skin covering goosebumps. Power radiated off of him. He spoke to me. Get some firewood, he said in his forced tone, and he smiled wide. At that moment, Ben emerged from the woods. Ben, Justine cried. Jesus, Ben said as Justine squeezed him. Did you guys hear that cat thing? We think it was an elk, Mark said. Where were you? Why did you take so long? Justine asked. I guess I wandered too far off and I lost sight of the campfire. It took me a bit to find my way back. For a second I thought I was going to have to freeze my ass off out there alone tonight. The relief watched over my body like a wave, crashing into my muscles. I felt each one relax. At least Ben was safe. I looked for the strange man, but he was gone. He somehow slinked away while I was distracted. He was good at going undetected when he wanted to. My thoughts turned to getting out of there, even though Ben was unharmed. That guy was still trouble. I started back towards the group and caught the middle of their conversation. Yeah, who was that guy? Ben said. I thought he was with you guys, Sarah said. Yeah, isn't he your friend? Mark added. I thought he drove over with you three. Um, no, Ben said. I don't know him. The panic spread over everyone's faces. They were finally feeling what I was feeling. The realization had set in. We need to get out of here, I said, before he comes back. Yes, please, Justine said. We have to leave now. The guy was a freak, right, Porter? I explained to them how I noticed he was the odd man out when we were sitting around the campfire. I explained the odd behavior, and they all agreed the guy was strange and possibly dangerous. None of us could pinpoint exactly when he had joined the group. He had slipped unnoticed and unaccounted for. It was strange. We packed our tents in record time. We tracked the 15 minutes to our vehicles through dark woods, flashlights in hand. We heard the screech of the elk again, if it was an elk, which I have my doubts about now, and we took some comfort from the fact it sounded further away. Even so, we picked up our pace for the final stretch of the walk. I felt like I could finally relax behind the wheel and lock doors of my SUV. Justine and Ben sat in the back, while Mark and Sarah followed behind us in Mark's old beaten up vehicle. We were heading out of the woodland and were planning to shack up in a motel for the night before heading home in the morning. I thought we were free and clear. We worked our way around the dark roads that snaked through woods. I let a smile open up my face when we finally reached the exit road. It was an arrow straight stretch of asphalt that split through the last few miles of woodland. I pressed on the gas. I couldn't wait to get the hell out of the woods. And I think Mark was feeling the same way because he sat close on my rear bumper. I remember thinking, at least we'll have a strange tale to tell after all this. I didn't think it was about to turn into a horror story. The trees and the dashed lines on the road blurred past us. My headlights reached out for the endless road and my meter needled its way towards 100 miles per hour. I don't know what possessed me to go that fast and I wish Mark hadn't followed my lead. It was a mistake. The strange man appeared from behind a tree. He walked into the middle of my lane. I slammed the brakes. 
but it was too late. The next sequence of events happened so fast it placed like a slideshow in my mind. The tire screeched and there was a smell of burning rubber. The strange man folded over my vehicle and got sent flying down the road. He skated across the pavement on his back, moving with such speed it looked like he was gliding on ice. More tire screeching. Mark flew past in the opposite lane, fish telling. He fought it, and for a moment I thought he had it saved. But the vehicle hooked right into the trees. The sickening sound of crunching metal sounded in the air. Mark's car slammed into a tree, driver's side first, sending fragments of glass and metal flying. The car bounded off one tree and into another. The front passenger side impacted this time. The front light exploded and the passenger side cavity caved in, sending a wheel bounding into the woods. The crumpled heap of a car came to a rest. Justine was the first out the door crying out Sarah's name. Ben went after her, and I follow after him. Everything felt surreal, as shock coursed through my body. It was as if I was watching through a screen. I floated over the asphalt as Justine and Ben sprinted towards the streaming wreckage. The crash seemed dimly lit by my SUV's one remaining headlight. There are two screams I'll never forget. They imprinted themselves on my brain. And I'm going to hear their echoes at night forever. The first one I heard was when I was 13. It came from my mother. It flooded the house, splashing off the walls. I ran out of my room to see her crumple at the front door with two police officers standing by. They had notified her that her eldest son, my brother, had died. The second came from Justine when she saw what was waiting for us in the vehicle. Mark was unrecognizable. He was a shattered mess of bone, skin, and blood blended and intertwined with the crumpled steel. Sarah was blinking slowly. Her breathing labored. Her one arm shattered, broken in too many pieces to count. Her legs crushed at knees from the front of the vehicle which crumpled back into her leg space. Her legs would have been flat if I could see them. Justine turned away and fell to her knees with her face buried in her hands. Ben tried to comfort her, but he had to turn away and throw up on the side of the road. I pulled out my phone and struggled to dial 911. With my fingers shaking, I kept pressing the wrong numbers. My voice was small and distant as I explained what happened to the operator. She told me to stay on the line, but as I looked down the road, I dropped my phone. The strange man was standing there. His grin reached from ear to ear, showing a grandstand of his teeth. His shoulders shrugged up and down as if he was laughing. In fact, the fucker was laughing. If I were not in shock, I would have gone after him right there and then. I would have torn his heart, if he has one, right from its chest. But all I could do was stare, struggling to keep the tears behind my eyes. The strange man started for the woods. I watched them go, and I watched them change. I saw it. I know I did. This was no illusion, no trick of the mind. This was real. I saw him. Shapeshift. I saw. It's true. Form. We were not dealing with something human that night. After countless hours of research, I believe I saw what others have called the goat man. Its horns were sticking out, uneven from its head, with rows of sharp teeth and walking upright. Like a man with an awkward gait, it vanished into the shrouded woods. It's been eight months since that night. I've only seen my friends a handful of times since then. Our relationships have shattered and are left in ruin. All we are now to each other is a stark reminder of that night. Mark is dead. 
Sarah survived. But as a triple amputee, Justine and Ben broke up. And here I am, rugged with a scraggly beard and hair that has been uncut after spending every sleepless night researching this monster I saw that night, the goat man. I'm going back to those woods. I'm coming for the goat man and I'm not stopping until one of us is dead. I grew up in K-Town on the res. One of the guys I knew in school was named Daniel. He was a true jokester. Never a serious moment. Always pulling pranks. One day I see him in the cafeteria and I go sit at his table cause it looks like he's troubled. I sat down and was like, hey what's up? The interrupted story that poured out of him terrified me. Daniel said that he was up at a family sheep camp. He said he was there alone when a coyote that looked as large as a bear came out of hiding behind some pine trees. It looked at Daniel, smiled, and said, I'm going to get you, Daniel. Daniel said that when he heard this, he almost peed on himself and ran close to 13 miles back to town as fast as he could. He said that by the time he reached town, it was dark, and he could hear the coyote yelling far behind him. I'm gonna get you, Daniel. He made it home, jumped in bed and stayed awake in fright for the rest of the night. Then, he said that throughout the night, he could hear that same voice outside his window. I'm gonna get you, Daniel. He told me the story the next day. It was up to that point. The only time I had encountered Daniel to be completely stone cold serious. I offer that maybe one of the medicine men in town can help him. But Daniel was done with the subject from then on. I'm gonna log off till tomorrow night. You all can message me there if anyone is interested in knowing more about this. Let me give you some advice if you ever go camping in the woods, in the middle of nowhere, or even near the Navajo Res. The smell of copper and blood means there is a skinwalker near. My grandfather told me a story once. He said how he went camping in the woods with five friends and he sat around a fire. He nonchalantly counted heads and there were six of them and he said there was a copper smell in the air and after a while they went into the camper and the sixth guy stood over every one and stared at them for hours and as he was awake the whole time he was debating on doing something but he said that eventually the sixth guy just ended up leaving them my grandfather then said that he didn't go back to sleep and that he told his friends the next morning and they decided to pack up everything and leave. My grandfather tells me that skinwalkers will usually approach you, study you, watch your behavior in order to blend in with your group when you're out in the woods. So be careful out there if you ever go camping with a group of friends. As you're sitting around the campfire, sleeping, having fun, drinking a beer. Always count those who are around you. Make sure nobody or something sneaks in. This story comes out of Arizona. Three siblings are returning home to the reservation for a weekend visit with their parents. Their trip is taking them from Phoenix to the family home in Low Mountain and Pinion. It's a trip of about five hours. They leave fairly late in the evening. As they approach Keem's Canyon Highway, they turn onto a dirt road leading straight into Low Mountain. 
Just before they reached the dirt road, they noticed an old lady bent from age and walking with a cane on the side of the highway. It is about two o'clock in the morning. She has a scarf over her head and a long black jacket beneath and she is also wearing a green dress. Their only thought is that it's a late hour for walking along an isolated highway pretty much in the middle of nowhere. The reservation is really dark at night and there is barely anyone driving on the roads. After they pass the old woman, they make the turn onto the dirt road. A mile later, they notice the same old lady, bent and walking with her cane there on the side of the dirt road. Spooked by the incident and finding no explanation that would provide for the woman's presence, they had been passed by no other vehicle since turning onto the back road. The older brother, who is driving, steps on the gas and puts distance between them and the roadside specter. Together, the three of them recite some words in Navajo to protect them from any dark medicine. Eventually, they reach the highway that leads to Chinli. As they come to the first overpass, they see that same old lady sitting on the shoulder pavement with her head down and waving the cane in the air. Before they can pass her by, the car stalls out and they are required to row to a stop a short distance past the woman. Desperately, the older brother attempts to get the car started, but there's no response. At this point, with all three of them panicking, the old lady stands up, facing the opposite way, so they can't see her face and she walks to the other side of the road. Once there, she turns her head for but a moment and they see that her face is painted black. She keeps walking and eventually disappears in the distance. Now, out of sight, the brother again turns the key in the ignition and the car starts. They make it to their parents' home with no further encounters. When they tell their parents about the experience, their fathers tells them of an old Navajo couple with a house back in the trees somewhere between the two highways. They are rumored to practice bad medicine and bewitch people. From what he knows, the old man passed away recently and ever since then, the old woman has been frequently been seen at night walking the highways and the back roads. I heard this account from a guy that I knew. He was my friend when we were in a small town in Oklahoma with a decent size native population. Anyways, this guy, he's not actually Navajo, but he's Mexican. He's the nicest dude you would ever want to meet. He was about 35 at the time. He had a family. He was honest. A good nature guy that I could never see making something up for no reason. But we were hanging out one night and we were telling scary stories. And he was telling me about the most scariest situation that he's ever been in. He said he was driving back to the US after visiting family in Mexico. His wife was in the passenger seat, asleep. He wasn't too far from the border, so he decided to keep driving a little after midnight instead of stopping somewhere for the night. It was sort of a desert type road. He says he was going about 65 miles per hour when he noticed something in his peripheral vision out in the darkness, out the passenger window. And it was keeping up with him. Obviously, this got him shook. He hit the gas. 70, 75, 80, 85. And it was still keeping up with him. At this point, he thought he was going crazy. He thought it was just his tiredness playing tricks on his eyes. Until it changed directions. Instead of moving parallel with his car, it began to angle back towards the road. 
in a manner almost to intercept the vehicle. As it got closer, more light hit it, and he said it looked like a human. He told me it was slightly shadowed from the darkness, but he was for sure it was a humanoid form. He then accelerated to 90, and a few seconds later, it angled back into the darkness and was gone. As he finished telling me the story, I could tell his eyes were welled up and his hands were trembling. And this was a tough no BS dude. It physically struck him to the core just to recall it. Not surprising, he said he has never gone back to Mexico in a vehicle. Now, he said that whenever he does go visit, he only goes on flights.